It was a large room full of people, all kinds. And they had all arrived at the same building at more or less the same time. And they were all free. And they were all asking themselves the same question. What is behind that curtain? Welcome everybody to this uh, afternoon session um, about self-tracking and the reproductive body. My name is uh, Ola Bjorn Petersen and, uh, and the format uh, in this session will be the same as in the other sessions. So we have three uh, 20 minutes presentation and then we'll have a half an hour for discussion and, and questions uh, uh, at the end. So I, I I hope that everybody, including myself and uh, somebody, will uh, stick to the 20 minutes so that we have time for discussion. So first I would like to, to welcome uh, Lucy van, van der Wiel. Uh, you are a sociologist uh, and member of ReproSoc, which is Reproductive Sociology Research Group in Cambridge, and I've done some really interesting research on the field of reproduction and aging. So please welcome. Hello everyone, thank you very much for being here, for making the time at this exciting day after a very exciting night for those of you who are in the UK. Um, today I'd like to talk about the datification of reproduction um, and specifically about the interface. Oh, let me see if this works. Yes. So the interface of um, digital technologies and reproductive technologies. One of the key questions that uh, we are concerned with in reproductive sociology um, is the focus on reproductive decision making. So why do people reproduce? What technologies do they use and why? And how are these decisions situated in particular social cultural structures, as well as um, looking at what their implications may be? Today I would like to focus on reproductive decision making, but focus not on the motivations of individual people, but rather on the new developments in the fertility industry that provide the conditions for making such reproductive choices. And in doing so, I focus on the datification of reproduction. So as we all know in this conference, as is the case in many other fields in medicine and in society more broadly, there's an increasing use of large data sets. Um, datification refers to a development characterized by an increasing number of aspects of reproduction that can be measured and monitored and treated as technical problems with technical solutions. And this is not just about the use of data, but the optimization of fertility and technologized reproductive processes with computation in ways that generate and use large data sets. So by focusing on this, I want to look beyond the fertility clinic to the institutional structures that play a role in making certain treatments more or less available and play a key role in the reproductive decision making itself, as well as imagining and conceptualizing human biology, reproductive technologies and the treatment logic that is associated with them. Um, one aspect of that are, is fertility tracking, which we have seen today in Amanda's presentation, for example. Deborah Lupton has written a lot about it. So I'm not going to focus too much on that, but there's a lot of investment in um, f different fertility apps where you can either manually enter information about your cycle or use wearables uh, on your underarm or in your ear or in your vagina that um, measure things um, to help you have a sense of um, fertility, reproductivity, and um, uh, related issues. But today I want to focus on time-lapse embryo imaging, which is um, something different. It's the tracking of an intimate other whose ontological status is not wholly separate from the self. 
Um, but it's not self-tracking, but rather embryo tracking. And in order to talk about this, I want to start with this baby. This is baby Eva. And she was born in 2013 uh, and was claimed to be the first baby to be born with a new technology that was also called Eva, but with two E's. And this technology films Eva, as we see here. This is Eva at the first stage, uh, at the one cell stage, and then the first cell divisions that lead up to the embryo that eventually grew into uh, the baby Eva that we just saw. Um, this technology is time-lapse embryo imaging. And the way it works is that uh, normally when you do IVF, you um, create embryos out of fertilized eggs, or you fertilize eggs, which may become embryos, and then they stay in the incubator for a couple of days before they are implanted into the womb. This period in the incubator traditionally um, was um, interrupted once a day, when an embryologist would take the Petri dish out of the um, incubator and have a look at it under the microscope. Now, with time-lapse embryo imaging, you can leave the embryos inside the incubator and ha instead have a camera that takes pictures every um, five minutes or so and turns that into a video. And then on the basis of that video and the timing of the cell divisions, um, decisions can be made about which embryo is most likely to be viable. So they compare the, um, the data of these images to existing data of um, the embryos that went on to become um, healthy babies. So what are the implications for this type of reproductive decision making for the different actors involved, including intended parents and um, embryologists, as well as what kind of origin stories does it present it to us? Um, it got a bit of press coverage at the time and was presented as a, one of the biggest breakthroughs in IVF in the last couple of decades. But, you know, it was only one of several machines. Here we see three machines. The most recent machine is developed by uh, Jenea in Australia, which is called Jerry. Um, and these machines have, um, uh, are being distributed quite widely now. So in the UK, the majority of clinics use or at least have these machines in their labs. Um, at the moment, when we look at baby Eva, which we just saw, we see a particular origin story of um, a single embryo. Um, we see this origin story of um, an individual that, as it were, starts with the first cell division being used in marketing. So this image is not just for diagnosis, but it's also for um, uh, communicating with a wider audience what a technology is and what the IVF process is. So this is a video by um, Care Fertility, which is the largest fertility chain in the UK, um, which promotes its um, what they call Care Maps, which is a time-lapse imaging, embryo imaging uh, technique, by showing this um, progression from the cells to a toddler. And in a sense, this seems to correspond to an idea that uh, is upheld in pro-life debates, that life begins at conception, which we see, for example, in embryo adoption agencies in the US, where um, embryos are called pre-born humans, and um, they're called the snowflakes that can be adopted um, by intending parents. At the same time, though, we see something a little bit different happening here because not every embryo that we see through this technology is presented as a potential human being. There's another set of images that we see here which show the grid with wiggling embryos that um, show how they all develop differently. And rather than these all being potential babies, they are more presented as a collective that represents the need for selection because they show that certain embryos develop differently than others and certain may be more viable than others. Um, so with its weak and strong elements, it complements the discourse of um, the difference you need for your IVF success. This is a quote from the Fertility Clinic's website or another quote to help reduce the risk of IVF failure. This risk course of, di of risk and success is matched in the conclusion of high-low. So we see an inscription of whether or not there's a high or a low chance of um, viability. So what distinguishes these two images of the individual embryo and the embryo collective that represents uh, a potential in its uh, group formation is not so much the image itself because the one is simply a zoomed-in version of the other. Rather, what separates is, is uh, a sense of temporality. So um, we see that the embryo images of the babies, uh, so the embryos being presented as a baby, only pre are presented as such after the baby is born. And then they retrospectively look back and say, oh, this was um, 
the start of this particular individual's life. Whereas these images are anticipatory. They show this is the potential that may happen that hasn't happened yet. And you see this how the images are being used in the clinical setting as well. So with care, mix, um, with care maps of the care fertility group in the UK, for example, the IVF download of your transferred embryo is part of the IVF package. And you only get this download after implantation. And then you get a video of the particular embryo that has been implanted rather than um, all the embryos that have been created. Um, so it's a kind of retrospective intervention here or a retrospective image. Um, on the other hand, in, um, you see the collective images being used as in the counseling app. So in the hardware and in the software of these machines um, is an inbuilt patient communication component, which allows physicians and clinicians to share this visual information with intended parents throughout the process. And uh, this is particularly visible in, um, in an experiment in Jenea where they are showing um, live stream images of the embryos so that intended parents can live stream the embryos from the incubator to their um, iPads at home. And they describe this here as we see someone um, quite attached to this uh, possibility of the development of this embryo. Although we see a single embryo here, in fact, when you look at the app, there is, again, uh, a collection of embryos that present the possibility of um, uh, potential viability in the future in a pregnancy. Now, this notion of touch, the touch that we saw with the intended father on his chest is also the moment of embryo selection for the embryologist. Um, this is a bit of a silly image because clearly none of these embryos have even developed, so it's not a time for, for decision-making yet. But in this marketing image, it shows the touch of the screen as the moment of decision-making. And this points to a third type of embryo besides the individual, the collective. Um, it points to the third type, namely the historical population of embryos that have been aggregated in data sets. The um, type of decision-making that is afforded through this technology allows for a comparison to a much larger scale of um, other embryos and of data about existing embryos that went before this um, particular embryo in this case. And that creates new dynamics in reproductive decision making. So um, on the one hand, you see, for example, that the, um, the spatiality and the temporality of embryo selection changes. So the time of the clinic doesn't need to be adjusted to the time of uh, the embryo anymore because embryologists can simply play back earlier images of the embryo. And likewise, spatial limitations shift because the embryologist doesn't even have to go to the, to the lab to see the embryo. They can view the embryos from a remote office or from their homes. And instead of touching the Petri dish and looking at it through a microscope, they can touch the screen of the um, embryoscope or another machine to interact with um, this this clump of cells. Um, and of course, a large part of this is the, um, the data-rich digital embryo observation that becomes possible here. So we see here a form of assisted seeing through data correlations um, that integrate calculation and observation. So it doesn't just zoom in for detail and distance, but it allows embryologists to see through correlations for seeing regularity in temporally and spatially dispersed multitudes of embryos. And the next step may be that um, not just parameters that can be downloaded from um, central, um, central data um, analysis centers that um, allow the individual clinics to use the parameters and the al algorithms that come with the machine um, to analyze the embryos in this case, and I'll talk more about that later. But um, the next step would be to use machine learning and artificial intelligence alongside the intelligence of the uh, embryologist to create new algorithms to meet um, uh, the demand for better, or at least within this paradigm, better uh, selection of embryos. So what are the effects of this? Basically, it moves away from the embryologist as the sole decision maker, but includes larger institutional players who own datafied lenses onto embryonic development. And in doing so, it generates new data for algorithms for embryo selection that is potentially even more valuable than the machines themselves. And in this way, there's an increased importance of having larger companies and larger clinics, or at least collaborations, that share data with each other, as opposed to having smaller embryology teams that um, um, work with smaller data sets. 
so in relation to this, I'd like to move on and look at the different forms of consolidation that happen um, in order to make these data flows possible. Um, here we see, for example, Vitro Life is one um, distributing company that you see a clear, the, the green bar is the sales of these embryo imaging machines. We see a, a clear increase them, in them in the last couple of years. Um, but it's not just the sales of these machines, but also the patenting of the um, a particular method that comes with this and um, the consolidating developments that become possible uh, in, the, um, in the use of these, uh, this particular technology. So I just mapped it out here in this particular family tree. So we see, for example, the EVA that I started with, with baby EVA. The EVA technology um, was owned by the Oxygen Company, which merged with Fertility Authority, which is the largest online platform in the US to give fertility information, uh, which has one million visitors a month. They merged into Progeny, which is a dig digital health company to promote um, uh, fertility treatments. And I'll go into that in a minute. Um, they, as well as um, the Jinea, the um, Australian fertility chain, are both now collaborating with Merck, a large um, pharmaceutical company that is distributing these machines across the world and, and making them available globally. On the other end, we see um, that Vitrolife and Fertilitech were producing two different systems and they have now merged, uh, Vitrolife has bought Fertilitech to um, basically phase out the machine that uh, was first made by Vitrolife and replace it with the embryoscope, primarily. Um, just to move into progeny, we see a kind of horizontal and a vertical integration in this consolidation. So the vertical integration means that there's many different services that all um, support reproductive technologies that are now housed in one single company. So instead of having a fertility clinic and some other companies, you see Progeny as a digital health company that combines, for example, online platforms, uh, financing, so fertility loans, fertility insurances, um, uh, the biotech side of these selling these machines, as well as um, creating online communities and um, creating concierge services, so giving information to people about um, their experiences with facility treatments and the likelihood that they may need one. So just to illustrate that, uh, they have the EVA machine, but they also have the fertility loans. They have, um, this is the online platform that I mentioned before with one million visitors. Um, and this is a large online um, fertility forum. Now, what we see is that the EVA technology bleeds into all these different dimensions of activity. So, um, uh, for example, in the forum, you see moderators that are st starting up discussions about this technology. And they say it's a great alternative to um, genetic uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, for example. Or you see on the web portal with information about fertility treatments that there is clearly a lot of information about this particular technology in there. Um, where it's seen as a technology that's recommended by experts. In this interview with the CEO of the company, which we don't have time to look at now, oh no, let's not do that, she describes how she makes it part of what they call a smart cycle. So they include it in insurance packages um, that employers use for their employees so that if the employer uses this particular package of this company, they can also access time-lapse embryo imaging um, as part of that package. So this is what I mean with the horizontal integration. You have many different kinds of services that all come together to um, promote particular reproductive technologies. We see that the fertility industry is growing at the moment and there's a potential for further growth as only a small number of people who have um, infertility issues can access treatments at the moment. And this is very much seen as a, as a business opportunity and there's a lot of expected growth and current growth at the moment. Um, but a challenge to that is that the, um, some of the pharmaceutical companies that provide the um, hormonal stimulant drugs are running out of the patents for those drugs. So you see an in investment of pharmaceuticals in general into um, biotechnologies as an, a different way of generating revenue. Um, so we'll move over that. And this leads to the other aspect, the vertical integration. So that means that the entire IVF journey, the different steps in the IVF procedure, are consolidated within one company. So that um, the various as uh, different steps from um, 
incubation to fertilization to tissue culturing to implantation, all the different steps of those, uh, if they all become headed under one company, it becomes an opportunity to um, um, create more revenue per cycle. And with time-lapse embryo imaging, it allows companies to include an extra step in the IVF procedure that requires extra investment, both on the part of the intended parents, if they have um, a set of that intended parents pay extra for this particular selection technique, or by the clinics themselves by buying the machines, as well as by sharing the data afterwards, which in and of itself becomes valuable. Um, so yeah, we see this in in vitro life, and we also see this in um, Merck, which is quite explicit about creating its fertility portfolio as what they call a holistic fertility provider. So they say we have products for every stage of the reproductive cycle, and um, they emphasize the importance of standardization, automation, and objective assessment, which is very much in keeping with their investment in technologies like time-lapse embryo imaging. Um, now, the tragic thing is that time-lapse embryo imaging doesn't necessarily work. There have been some large overview studies that show that the um, quality of evidence was moderate or low, that there is not currently enough evidence to say that this is worth um, the investment in the sense of increasing the likelihood of a successful live birth. Um, so why is it still influential if it potentially doesn't work that well? Well, one claim is that... Um, it, one claim is that the technology will keep on Im improving, so it's fine to invest in it now and it, maybe it will be better later on. Another claim is that it's a good incubator, so even if the analysis doesn't work that well, we have the incubator that is of good quality, so it's a good investment anyway. Um, then there is the argument about the value of the images for the patient both in terms of patient communication and in terms of marketing. And indeed, uh, the embryologists that I've spoken to have said that there is a patient preference through the direct-to-patient marketing of these machines, that um, they ask their clinicians whether they can use this machine so they can see the embryos as they develop. Um, and of course, the, the different, uh, we've just saw that some of the sales figures. Once a clinic has bought the machine, it has been an investment that has to be earned back. So um, that makes sense to um, promote the technology to that degree. Um, difference per clinic. Okay, great. Well, I'm getting to the end. So um, this is most obvious in, um, as we saw in Merck, which um, owns both, or at least distributes both the EVA technology and the progeny um, um, as well as the Jinea Jerry technology. And we see that the machine now becomes part of new knowledge production, um, new modes of knowledge production and new clinical protocols. And these new protocols require automation and standardization. There is a potential for the data sets of adding value, but that, require regimes of, uh, that requires regimes of standardization that are solidified through technological lock-ins. And, and there's a range of things, so there's not just these um, time-lapse imaging machines, but also the automatic vitrification machines, specific uh, medium that comes with it, um, then there's particular interfaces that are attached to it in order to document the patient information. So there's, a, there's a, uh, an, an added, um, yeah, there's a sort of solidification of different technologies once you opt into one thing. Now, the machines create the conditions of emergence for the creation of novel data infrastructures and large data sets on embryonic development. What is of interest in the coming years is then to see how technological developments and consolidating companies affect the flows of datafied embryo populations whose incubated imagery becomes valuable in its aggregation across time and space. So, to conclude, um, the datification of reproduction in time-lapse embryo imaging should be read in relation to broader developments, which point to shifts in clinical practice, different types of knowledge production, a sociality of datafied embryo selection which instigates new relations between clinics, patients and companies, a consolidation and commercialization of data-driven uh, reproduction, and new regimes of standardization that directly affect clinical practice, and the kind of reproductive decisions that embryologists and patients make. Time-lapse embryo, Im embryo imaging as a case study thus gives insight into the kind of business collaborations that are emerging in the fertility sector and how they redistribute responsibilities for reproduction between patients, corporations and clinicians, thereby creating different modes of agency and rationales for making reproductive decisions about embryos. And these are all shifts that lie at the foundation of how we understand, select and value the beginning of life. Thank you. 
So first, thanks to, to the organizers for, for, for giving us the opportunity to share our experience here with, um, with, with home and self-monitoring of uh, women with pregnancy complications. We are Sarah Maria here, who is a senior anthropologist at the Alexandra Institute here in Aarhus. And I'm an obstetrician, also based here in Aarhus. And, and besides being an obstetrician, I also have worked with, with home and self-monitoring for since 2009. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, Tina here. This is or could be Tina, uh, pregnant in, in, in 20 weeks, so her second pregnancy. And she got a certain pregnancy complication called PPROM where the water breaks or the membrane breaks in, in 20 weeks. So some of you who work in the health field might know that this is far too early and, and is, is a serious complication because it can cause infection um, for the mother and, and the baby, which can both be life-threatening for, for, for both. Therefore, the, uh, these women are hospitalized for, for, for daily monitoring with, with this uh, device here, which is called a CDD. It, it registers the fetal heart rate with the ultrasound. But that means that every time the baby moves, so it has to be adjusted. So that's some, something that can only be done at the hospital. And we also do daily or frequent blood sampling for monitoring of the infection status. So Tina uh, have a husband and a child that was two years at the west coast of, of Denmark. And now she have to stay at our hospital here in Aarhus for up to 14 weeks. Uh, th then we would deliver her. I mean, it, it's heartbreaking how much it, it's, it, it affects the, the, these women living a normal life then suddenly being hospitalized. Uh, it's, it's really, really tough for them and their family, in including their, their children. So we have been thinking about how can we fulfill this vision here? How, how can we let, let women be at home, but, but still maintain the, 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 the level of security, the, the, the monitoring level, which has so far been impossible uh, until these invasions here. In 2009, a, a, a company called Monica, based in, in the UK, came up with a device that, that, that traced or registered the heartbeat of the mother and the fetus in, in, in a very different way. It was just losing, using electricity. So the mother could put on just electrodes on the tummy, and then potentially the woman can do this at home. And, and the other development was this increasing number of, of what are called micro-laboratories where, where you can actually do the analysis of the blood samples at home too. And, and, and with these devices here, we, we set up a pilot project in 2010 uh, because we wanted to test this, whether it had any meaning or, or would work. For a platform for transferring the data from from the woman to, to, to us at the hospital. We just bought a commercially available platform and it worked, it did the job. But very quickly we realized that, that we had a lot of ideas, we want other functionalities, we want uh, uh, something changed. And when we then went to the company, we realized that, well, this was closed source, so it was either impossible or would take a very long time or be very expensive or all in both. So after a year, we decided that we would use the rest of our money for developing a new platform based on just consumer electronics, just the standard Android platform, uh, which was much cheaper and the data transfer is much, much cheaper. And we decided that this, that the programming should be done in open source so that, that if this was a good idea, all the other colleagues in Denmark or others could, could, could use this and also contribute to the further development of this, of this platform. So we started, and this slide here shows all the ideas, all the knowledge we had about how to, how to involve patients and clinicians in such a development process. You know, we had no idea, to, to be honest. But luckily, uh, Sam Maria and Morten came to, came to us saying, well, we have heard about, you have this interesting project, maybe we could help you. Yep, and so on, great. <laughs> Uh, just have to put it in my back pocket. Yep. Yeah, yes, please. Um, yeah, well, we had a um, 
bit of a paradigm shift, you can say, in this uh, in this project, because method-wise, we started out with doing a lot of ethnographic fieldwork, but also used a lot of different techniques from uh, something called participatory design, origin from the computer science, uh, you know, computer science studies, and well. The classical role of the patient is being passive, is being subordinate, and just doing as told. But uh, the thing about participatory design is that you actually involve the users and the, uh, the end users uh, to a very high degree. And we wanted to do this with our, pati uh, with our patients that really didn't want to be called patients. They wanted to be called pregnant women with a complicated pregnancy. So they didn't see themselves as patients, which was very um, interesting. So we wanted to make them very active in this uh, project, but how could, we, how could we involve them without being uh, way too obstructive when they wanted to, to just be normal women with a normal pregnancy? Yep. And, yeah. We, um, we involved the, the pregnant women to a very high degree. Uh, basically to give them a bit of treatment both, both for themselves but also for other pregnant women in the future. And the thing is that with all these measurements that the women had to make at home, they, all, they gained a certain knowledge of uh, their, their diagnosis. They knew when they had a rather high blood pressure, they knew if they had gained weight. Uh, they also knew if there was protein levels in their urine. So in this way, they got an um, informed decision. Uh, well, they had the opportunity to, together with the clinicians, to make informed decisions about their treatment. And that made it a whole different um, way of interacting with the clinicians because it's m much more on, on eye level, uh, this way of uh, doing, um, doing the measurements. And they could also, to a very high degree, uh, talk with the clinicians about their uncertainty and their concerns in their pregnancy because they had a whole new like, uh, area of information to talk about and to talk from. Yeah. So, we had a lot of um, different techniques b borrowed from the um, participatory design tradition. Um, but before we really could use these techniques, we had to have um, some, some data uh, in order to analyze. Uh, and we did that by performing a lot of um, field work, very time consuming. Uh, we followed the, the pregnant women from when they were included in the project until they delivered. That also meant planned and unplanned visits at the hospital, uh, home visits and interviews and phone calls just to check up with them. And the, the women actually agreed to be followed this closely because they could see the benefit for themselves. They could stay at home instead of being hospitalized all the time or going to, into the hospital two or three times a week. Uh, bear in mind that some had to drive at least 100 kilometers to, to go to the, to the hospital. And they could, to a larger degree, feel like normal pregnant women. They could store away all the equipment when they were done uh, doing their measurements and then they could just go on with their everyday lives and perhaps also their, uh, their children and husband. Um, yeah, We also did a lot of field work with the clinicians, the midwives, and nurses and doctors at uh, different wards so we could see um, what their everyday life uh, working life looked like. So we could see uh, that when we have to develop a technology, it wouldn't be, uh, be too obstructive to their way of working. Um, yeah. And, I just have to use this. Then we had a lot of workshops. And what we have learned from the field work was that, well, clinicians, they're very skeptic. If there's no clinical evidence, well, then you're not really sure that you can trust it. So. We brought um, a pregnant woman, sorry, a pregnant woman to um, to actually talk with these clinicians because she would know what it was all about, and the clinicians could ask her all their questions and um, yeah, say their concerns out loud basically, and she would just answer. Um, and this worked very well with the midwives and the nurses, but the doctors they kept being a bit skeptical. But it was a really good uh, forum for, for the, the, the clinical staff just to, to say what they felt about this whole process. 
We also um, had workshops with uh, some of the pregnant women. You can see here that they have given birth already. And they just loved the technique because it was easy to use. Um, they could stay at home. That was uh, very important for them. But they could also um, see a potential for making it a lot better in the future. They all wondered why it wasn't an app, why they couldn't download it up from App Store or Android Market, that, but why they had to have this hospital tablet. Um, that was a bit, yeah, it could be done smarter, they thought. And they also uh, wanted to, for instance, see their own measurements. Instead of writing down the, their blood pressure every day, they wanted just to see it on the tablet because the information was on the tablet. They just needed to see it themselves uh, and thereby learning about their condition as well. Um, yeah. I'm changing. Yeah, um, as mentioned already, yeah, we had some resistance, but the uh, the nurses and the the midwives, as you can see here, they were quite eager actually to to hear more about what the pregnant women had to say because this um, setup actually ensured that the pregnant women felt safe, which is very important, and then that they also were able to relax in their pregnancy and basically just had much better um, um, pregnancies. Um, yeah. So as I said, the, the pregnant women, they wanted to use their own devices. They wanted to see the data and learn from the data, also share it with their husbands, because the husbands are also a very important factor in uh, when you're home monitoring. Um, and in this way, they could be a much higher uh, part of the, of the whole uh, process. And um, if this could be ensured with an app or something similar in the future, they would gladly share all their data just as long as it was on a, secu on a secure platform and um, it was safe to do. Yeah. Um, this is mine as well. Yeah. CAST um, performed a very big uh, evaluation of this whole uh, project. It's a, part, um, it's a smaller part of a large scale Danish project. And they found out that, well, of course, the, the pregnant women were very satisfied. The, some, to some degree, the, the nurses and midwives were. But there was also a positive business case, which was basically quite new, that it actually, you could provide the same or even better care and then save money. And you can see there, do we have that slide? Yep. Oh, oh yeah. sorry, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. so it was really, really good. And uh, you can see here what some of the, the pregnant women said. The, this about increased freedom and flexibility really meant a lot because a lot of these women, they could actually still go uh, continue working. They could care for their children. They could have a normal family life instead of being yeah, basically hospitalized in, in weeks or sometimes months for some of the more severe cases. Yep. And as you can see, these pregnant women, they... Um, they, they had a lot of good ideas. Um, this is actually um, an, a hospitalized uh, pregnant woman who uh, suffered from preeclampsia uh, up until her delivery. Um, she was hospitalized and had to do all these measurements uh, herself because they found out during the project that when you take a woman that's home monitoring, doing all these uh, uh, measurements at home, and then you put her in a hospital bed, she won't uh, allow the nurse or the midwife to come and check her blood pressure or measure her, her weight. They want to do it themselves because they're used to it. And you basically have a lot of time on your hands when you're hospitalized. So this is actually a chance to do something yourself and be active and still have a, a sense of being in contact with your body and not control, but, but have an, an, an insight into how, it, how it's going with you and your fetus. Um, yeah, so that is actually now the standard care at the hospital. Not only you can uh, do home monitoring, you can also be an inpatient uh, monitoring at the hospital. Yep. And actually getting a really good quality of uh, measurements. Just 
just briefly what 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 Sarah already mentioned was was that that the business case was was actually good uh, we, we, when we compared the the time used by the staff for 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 traditional uh, management of the patient uh, inpatient compared to home monitoring that there was an, there was a 77% reduction in the time used uh, by, by the staff which is quite something um, so now we have implemented this home monitoring and self-monitoring uh, as the standard of care for for pregnant for women with, with 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 pregnancy complications at our department. So all women where it makes sense. So it's selected groups uh, and and who can actually manage to, to do it. They will be doing it this way. Uh, during the implementation process, we have reduced the number of beds by forty four percent down to five beds. And we have 5,000 deliveries a year, all kinds of uh, high-risk deliveries. And if you so so one bed for 1,000 deliveries is one third, one third of all the comparable university hospitals in Denmark and and across Europe. Uh, and this and we couldn't have achieved that without uh, home and and, and self-monitoring, and still maintaining the patient satisfaction the. The, the the clinicians uh, satisfaction and also the quality so we also shared these ideas or, or, or became so so th this is a picture of a guy who was admitted to the department of infection diseases uh, last year he had a very severe infection and needed intravenous treatment for for, for many weeks but he got very confused i mean he he and which was which was very it was difficult for him, and it, it was a life-threatening infection he had. And they asked him, "What can we do for you to, 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 to be more, to feel more safe?" Here? And he said, "Bring my dog." Uh, so they did, and as we see, it, it it really helped him. But it's so difficult having a dog in the Department of Infection Disease at Skyby Sjøhus. So Marie, a colleague of me, called me and said, "We know that you are sending uh, women home with with for for infection monitoring. Can we borrow one of your sets?" And he said, "Of course you can." So they did, and it worked well. So so right after they they they, they set up a project still running at uh, the de Department of Infection Disease using uh, this equipment, the same equipment for for home monitoring of another patient group. And yesterday I had a meeting with the oncologists. Uh, who wanted to do home chemotherapy, which we, which others do, but 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 they wanted to monitor this special group who have a very high risk of infection while the immune system is, is maximally um, um, depressed. Is that the right word? Uh, suppressed. Sorry. Uh, and 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 they will use again the same platform. That they also found another micro lab, so they will start with that. Um, um, in 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 a few months, um, another thing that, that happened this year, two two days ago uh, in the morning, uh, we found out that that there was an, a new national financial agreement between the state and the regions that was signed, and this one included this point here that self home monitoring of women with pregnancy complications should be offered at all hospitals in Denmark in 2020. So. We were really happy about that, but also a little concerned about what's the political agenda, because despite our experience, which I shared with you, and 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 the the achievement with this closed open source thing, we have rumors about that what we will get as a system is is a monolith, is is a closed source system, uh, and I mean. What we have learned from from what we have been doing over the last years is that that we need something flexible. We need something that that can fun fulfill our needs if it's this one, or if if it's that one. So I think it, this is a really crucial. So so it's political, but also very much about about the w what do we need as professionals and 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 patients or, or, or citizens, we need a system that actually supports the, the way we work. We invent things, we get new ideas, we do research, we have, we have to test it, we have to implement, and the system should, should, should support this process. And of course, use open standards. It's also about what you've heard from, from other presentations here at the conference about um, democratic control, actually. But we also think that that that, that using a multi-vendor strategy can can actually fuel 
or, or, or support the, the, the innovation process for, for further development. So we think this is, is also important. It's not Lego that we, uh, that we need. This is an example of what's software Lego. It's microservice architecture, we suggest, where, where you have broken the system down to small bits, which is much easier for the company to deliver, um, so that you can have this bring your own device, or it's easier to, 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 to achieve that. And we also set up a public governance organization, which keep track of what's, what's, what's there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and also being able to to keep track who want what so th so that 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 the different departments groups patient groups can can say we want this functionality and then they can share their development costs. So we we think that point is important. And the last word I will give to Tina. She was she was the very first patient we had, uh, who who we sent home with her monitoring. Uh, and this was a letter that she sent to us uh, when she delivered uh, Anna's uh, in the uh, 35th week. And, and, and she, it was not 14 weeks, but, but it was, I think, 11 weeks that sh where she could be at home instead of being at the hospital. So, thank you. That. So, so, so you are a sociologist and work as a postdoc at Center for Reproductive Research at the, the De Montfort University in UK, is that correct? Yes. Uh, where you've done a, a research really interesting about social egg freezing. So. Thank you. So, oh, I've got to talk into this microphone, I assume. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the presentation we give Tuesday is going to be drawing on my PhD research, which was looking at women's use of egg freezing for non-medical reasons, or as it's sometimes referred to as for social reasons. Um, and this research was looking at women's use of this technology, but also um, the women talked about in these interviews, um, the precursor technology of this, um, or the technology which they used before freezing their eggs called ovarian reserve testing. So I'm going to be talking about these two technologies today. <coughs> Excuse me. So recent decades have seen a significant shift in the average age of um, uh, motherhood in lots of different Western countries. So in the UK alone, the average age of a woman at the birth of her first child has, has gone up by four years over the last four decades. And the average age of all mothers now stands at over 30 years of age. Um, in, the UK, in the UK uh, in 2015, over half, 53% of all live births in England and Wales were to women over the age of 30, and it was women aged 30 to 34 who had the highest fertility rate of any group. And this shift towards later motherhood has also been evidenced by data which shows for the first time in 2015, um, and this was the uh, first, first time since 1947, the fertility rate for women aged over 40 had risen above that of the fertility rate of women aged over 20. So there'd been this significant shift towards women having children later on in life. Furthermore, since 1981, the numbers of women having children over the age of 40 has trebled. Um, and this has been attributed to an increasing use and efficacy of assisted reproductive technologies, things such as IVF, um, donor, uh, donor conception, as well as uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So there's been a lot of celebration about these technologies which have been able to uh, help women have children at uh, older ages. However, there, have, there has been much concern around the risks posed by women having children at an older age, the risks both to the woman herself. Um, this is because as a woman ages, her ability to conceive a pregnancy um, and carry that pregnancy through to full term declines. So much so by the time a woman is in her, in her early 40s, she's more likely to experience a miscarriage than a live birth due to um, problems with the, um, the woman's eggs. Um, so older motherhood is, is uh, recognised as being fraught with risks to the child as well. So a child is more likely, uh, or the fetus is more likely to have chromosomal abnormalities um, when it's an older mother who's conceiving. And there's also risks to the woman herself, such as an increased risk of preeclampsia um, and other um, pregnancy-related illnesses. 
And data is also recently emerging, more uh, more recently, about the risks posed by older fathers, um, uh, uh, such as an increased risk of autism or schizophrenia in children born from older fathers. And questions continue to be asked about how well older parents can uh, uh, parent young children, whether they can do it as effectively as younger parents, and concerns still exist about the possibilities of young children or children losing their parents at a, at a young age. Um, however, data has shown that actually children who are born to older mothers often do very well uh, emotionally, psychologically, um, and this has been attributed to the fact in some cases these women are, are not only more mature but more financially stable. And um, research suggests that compared to younger mothers, older women tend to be more prepared for motherhood and are less likely to experience illnesses such as postnatal depression. So there is uh, some benefits, of course, of having children at an older age. So these concerns about um, delayed motherhood and age-related fertility decline have emerged alongside the emergence of um, new fertility monitoring devices and extension technologies. Um, so when I'm talking about fertility monitoring technologies, uh, this can range from low-tech devices, such as we've heard from a couple of times over the last couple of days, such as um, smartphone fertility apps, um, through to more high-tech and somewhat invasive forms of fertility monitoring, such as ovarian reserve tech. So the ovarian reserve tests seek to assess the quality and sometimes so the quantity and sometimes quality of a woman's remaining ovarian um, uh, remaining egg supply, with their aim to try and predict that woman's reproductive potential. So how how long she may be able to continue um, being fertile. And these ovarian reserve tests are undertaken through blood tests to measure hormone levels um, and can also be undertaken using transvaginal ultrasounds to look at uh, the number of visible ovarian follicles in an effort to predict a woman's fertility potential. Now, ovarian reserve tests have been historically used um, to help predict how well a woman will respond to fertility drugs when she's undergoing IVF. Um, and so the charging or the way that these ovarian reserve tests have been charged for have been as part of an IVF cycle. However, these tests are now being sold to women who may have not yet begun to try and conceive or even be sure they want to try and conceive, but want to have some information or estimation about their remaining fertility and how long perhaps they may be able to delay childbearing before becoming a mother. And so these ovarian reserve tests are now being sold independently from uh, uh, other forms of fertility treatment um, and are often marketed as fertility assessments, fertility checkups or fertility MOTs and can cost between two to three hundred pounds in the UK to access these, uh, this, this kind of version of screening really or testing. So in 2011, and in response to the rising age of motherhood and the low fertility in Denmark, researchers and clinicians at the Copenhagen University established the Fertility Assessment and Counselling Clinic, with its intention of providing individuals with no known reproductive pathology, so these people hadn't been trying to conceive unsuccessfully, the idea was to provide people information about their fertility potential to help guide them about their reproductive options. And this um, assessment was done using a Fertistat informed risk evaluation to help people, uh, w women as well as men, I'm focusing on women today, to have a better understanding of their fertility. Um, and using uh, an ovarian reserve test and a uh, self completion questionnaire, the, clini the clinicians grouped users of this. Um, this uh, fertility assessment using a kind of a traffic light system into low, medium or high risk of subfertility. So the idea was that these people would be able to be informed about their reproductive potential and potentially make decisions as a result of this. So while the information that's, that come from these ovarian reserve tests are come from relative, relatively advanced technological developments, this individualised information about fertility has also been increasingly available through the, these other low-tech means, as I said, we've heard a little bit about, um, and through bodily self-surveillance and through fertility apps that Deborah Lupton and other people have written about. And so these fertility apps, as well as things that just happen to exist already on iPhone 5s and above, en enable women, and it's particularly marketed at women, um, to record inf intimate information about cervical mucus, menstrual cycles, basal temperatures and sexual activity. 
And more recently, there's been new wearable technologies emerged um, uh, and smart jewellery, such as the Bella Beat, which is this little leaf looking type thing here, which can be worn as a necklace, a clip on, a, a different types of different ways. And these smart jewellery enable women to uh, track, uh, track uh, female functions, such as their period, ovulation, fertility tracking, as well as tracking of stress sensitivity and ongoing pregnancies. And these fertility monitoring apps and wearables and smart jewellery are very much as presented as offering the user the opportunity to learn more about their fertility by tracking their period or ov ov ovulation cycles to either optimise their chance of pregnancy when they're trying to conceive or minimise their chance of pregnancy when using the app or device as a form of birth control. So similar to other forms of self-tracking or monitoring, these technologies and the, these apps quantify bodily data. In this case, it's a woman's reproductive potential and essentially renders it visible and monitorable. And so the data, I suggest the data that these, um, the data and risk knowledge that these tests generate position women as being um, uh, informed and being able to make more uh, uh, informed and conscious decisions about their fertility and positions their fertility is more knowable and thus manageable and something that they can be they can take control of or manage and so the idea is that the information that these tests or these apps provide women um, it can help them potentially decide whether to put off becoming a mother put off, um, to bring forward childbearing, or to make use of other forms of assisted reproductive technology such as um, fertility extension technologies like egg freezing. Um, so some of you may, may have heard of egg freezing, it was a relatively under-researched area until uh, kind of the last five or six years or so, and egg freezing um, has uh, was first developed in the 1980s, and it was developed as a way to enable women to be able to preserve their fertility when faced with some kind of medical illness or treatment that would render them prematurely infertile. The technology wasn't very good for a long time, it still isn't great, but um, there was uh, a development called um, vitrification in the early 2000s that led to kind of a resurgence of interest in this technology and it's now being used by women to freeze eggs for the social reasons where they perhaps don't have a partner so wish to freeze their eggs say in their early 30s to come back and use them when they're in their early 40s uh, to conceive a healthy pregnancy and this is often referred to as social egg freezing and the users of these technologies have been found to be highly educated women um, in uh, professional roles um, and in most often white women as well so far and the motivation to these women is this, well, the work that I explored in my PhD such as the lack of a partner needing more time to become ready for motherhood um, now, there's been much discussion in academic circles as well as the, in the media about egg freezing. Um, and several authors have suggested that this fertility extension technology, as I refer to it as, um, it can be seen as um, another example of the medicalization of women's bodies. Um, however, I argue that the specific dimensions of this technology, um, but particularly its transformative possibility, its techno-scientific nature, actually reflects an intensified process of medicalization, um, which Clark et al. have referred to as biomedicalization. So those of you who might not be familiar with the literature, Clark et al. suggested that during the mid-1980s, the nature of medicalization changed as new techno-scientific innovations emerged, which began to transform biomedicine from the inside out. And they noted that whilst medicalization um, was co-constitutive of modernity with the desire for enhanced control over the external nature of, of the world around us, biomedicalization is co-constitutive of post-modernity with the desire to extend control by harnessing and transforming internal nature, by transforming life itself, we could use Rose's term. So whilst the concern of medicalization was restating normal reproductive ability via IVF, um, biomedicalization takes as its focus the transformation of bodies and lives through these technologies which go beyond restoring normal functioning and that's used not only for treatment but for optimization and enhancement purposes. Um, now, another significant shift between medicalization and biomedicalization concerns the way in which the latter, this biomedicalization, focuses on disability and illness and disease, not as matters of fate and inevitability, but instead conceives of as health as the ongoing management tr and treatment of risks through screenings, classifications, risk assessments, and the commodification of health as a lifestyle, lifestyle ideal. So the scope of biomedicalization is broader than that of medicalization through its, through its expansion to include self-surveillance and man management and, and monitoring. 
So these new technologies of ovarian reserve testing and social egg freezing, these fertility monitoring and, and extension technologies, which I, which I refer to them as, provide new ways of visualising but also regulating female fertility. And I suggest that these smart devices such as apps, wearable biosensors and these other developments in reproductive medicine have emerged alongside, but of course perhaps in response to, a political orientation which emphasises individual responsibility and the monitoring of personal behaviour, bodily behaviour. So in this neoliberal context, health and the responsibility for health or the responsibility for fertility is located within the individual and being healthy or being well becomes a moral obligation an individual responsibility requiring self-investment, uh, performance and management. And as we, are, as we know, under neoliberalism, a sign of um, responsible citizenship, uh, the good neoliberal individual consumer is required not only to account for risk, but expected to take action to mitigate against this risk and be responsible for any behaviours or lack of behaviours and bear any related penalties for not adhering or, or, respon or res responding to these risks. Now, I don't know what it's like in Denmark, but in the UK, certainly, older mothers are often presented, or older women having children are often presented as being selfish for electing to choose to delay childbearing, ignorant of the risks of, of, of doing so, and kind of feckless in their quest to have it all, because how dare they? Um, and these women are often routinely positioned as risky reproductive subjects. And I suggest that these fertility monitoring devices, the apps, the ovarian reserve testing, the wearable um, jewellery, these biosensors uh, serve to further reinscribe the risk that women pose to their reproductive potential through ageing and re renders visible the risk of age-related fertility decline in a new way that just wasn't possible just say 10 years ago or so. And these tests, these treatments, the, the, uh, the pro-fertility clinic at uh, Copenhagen, uh, pr by providing women uh, information about being high, medium or low risk of subfertility, are providing them individualised, personalised risk knowledge um, about their reproductive potential. And with this expectation of, well, so with this information, there is often this expectation that this knowledge, this risk knowledge could or should be acted upon by the individual to secure the particular futures that they desire. So if they, if, they, if they desire to become a mother, this information can be provided to them and they can make informed, sensible, um, responsible decisions off the back of this data. Because, of course, the good reproductive citizen would want to be informed of the risks posed by their ageing body and should be able to be in a position to respond and ac act accordingly to these risks. Now, we see um, this, this risk discourse and this expectation to act upon risk in reference to things such as prenatal screening and authors such as Hilt have... Um, referred to, I'm on the next slide, no, um, authors such as Hilt has referred to how new technologies and new ways of knowing um, and thinking about the body and the self causes new areas of responsibility to emerge. Once we know something, we cannot unknow it and have to make decisions and responsible uh, decisions on the back of this information. And similarly, fertility monitoring technologies are represented um, as empowering individuals to know thyself in new ways. Um, however, of course, with this information comes significant pressure and burden perhaps to appropriately respond to this risk knowledge five minutes, uh, five minutes that's fine so to not respond to this risk knowledge, we could say it places the user at odds with the neoliberal discourse, which promotes self-action, which promotes taking charge of one's health and opens up individuals to moral recriminations of blame if they don't do so. Now, in my interviews, um, uh, when other women I was talking about, about why they engage in egg freezing, they said, well, once I knew the technology existed, I felt I had to do it. I couldn't not engage with this technology because I'd blame myself. And I very much found this desire to be the good reproductive citizen in my data, but I don't really have time to go into that today especially now I know I have five minutes left actually I'm fine I'm fine I've only got a little bit left so um, this this kind of um, this desire to be the good reproductive citizen um, was very much within uh, my, my data as I kind of found it um, now the the um, so I said for, for an individual not to respond to risk knowledge as they receive it, say in this case about the fertility, presents that person, that woman, open up to moral recriminations for not doing enough to um, uh, uh, respond to the information they've been provided to. Um, 
And this is because the advent of fertility monitoring and extension technologies, risk has become highly individualised. It's being rendered, become visible in ways that wasn't really available before. And under neoliberalism, of course, the avoidance or management of risk is very frequently equated with empowerment. Um, and Galvin has noted this in her work, and she's noted how under neoliberalism, um, the management of risk shifts from the, extern from the external to the internal. Social problems are transformed into individual concerns, and an individual's body an individual or a person's body is seen as the site of, a, of social problems rather than the wider social context. So in this case, or in this instance, it's a woman's ageing body that is seen as, the, as seen as the problem rather than the social, cultural, economic uh, uh, kind of situation in which she lives, which makes the timing of motherhood difficult. Oh, so it's this woman's body that's seen as a problem rather than this social context. And Galvin has also identified how by not taking action and not avoiding risk um, and by failing to draw on specialist knowledge or biomedical resources such as those, those I've mentioned, an individual can be blamed for his or her illness. A woman can be blamed for her resulting infertility or age, uh, an inability con to conceive. So I suppose I have kind of some quite uh, uh, my critiques of the of these uh, ovarian reserve testing and the uh, the way that these technologies render fertility visible is that these forms of body monitoring, these fertility monitoring and extension technologies not only require women to bear more responsibility for the timing of motherhood and the management of their fertility, but these, these devices also contribute to the obscuring of the actual social, economic and relational factors which we know affect ti the timing of parenthood. Um, furthermore, this discourse of individual responsibility also reinforces the timing of motherhood as the concern and responsibility of women alone, whereas of course we know it takes two to, to, to make a family. And this, 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 uh, these technologies are obscuring the inherently relational nature of reproductive decision making. Furthermore, these technologies uh, often cost a lot of money, especially things like ovarian reserve tests, costing, say, uh, you know, several hundred pounds, egg freezing, several thousands of pounds. Um, and they're thus only available to particular individuals who are able to access these technologies and deploy them in a means to achieve their biographical project. They're only available to the particular reproductive entrepreneurs who are able to afford these technologies. Um, and can be seen as a form of boutique medicine or as Ginsberg and Rappers refer to as an example of stratified reproduction. And finally, similar to other forms of self-tracking, there are multiple ambivalences and anxieties um, in users who, who, who have articulated, in my research at least, uh, the ways in which they felt quite anxious about using these technologies, about the data that they provide. And this is because these technologies, like many other forms of assisted reproductive technologies, are not guaranteed. They don't provide a clear result or um, a secure future for these users. So there are many anxieties about how users could make use of these technologies. And we still don't know how women uh, interpret the data these tests generate, uh, how they integrate them, in, integrate them into their reproductive decision making, if they do at all. Um, and so as a result, this is very much a kind of a fertile area of research which perhaps warrants further investigation to look at how women are using these apps, using ovarian reserve testing to make reproductive decisions um, and if, these, uh, if this information that's provided is useful or just anxiety producing really. Thank you. So it was very clear. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you very much for your presentations. I, I think it was really interesting to hear uh, your reflections on, on this uh, matter. Uh, my colleague and I, we've been uh, very focused lately on the digitization of welfare in Denmark and um, or the political ambition of, uh, of, digi yeah, of making a digital welfare. And we've been looking at e-pregnancy as a case or an example, but more specifically e-pregnancy for women without complications. Because as I understand, this uh, project has been uh, happening for both women with and women without complications, right? So I have, I have two questions for you. Uh, 
related to to this um, e-pregnancy, that would be the first one would be, why do you think doctors, and I know you were a doctor, so that's why I'm asking you this question. Why do you think doctors were skeptical towards this uh, this project of monitoring or home monitoring? And uh, secondly, um, what do you know or what are you, to your knowledge, the, the reasons why this um, strategy uh, was not implemented or is not yet implemented for pregnant without complications? Well, um, thank you for the question. Um, first, the skepticism uh, among my, my colleagues, I, I think one was uh as 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 is um quite common in 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 our um in our profession group if you don't have evidence for 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 doing something well then don't do it and 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 then on the other hand the 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 another question could be are there ideas that are so good that you don't need evidence for for for, for doing it like it's better that being at home than being hospitalized for weeks and weeks but 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 another uh, the I think the major uh, resistance was um, if you go to a colleague who have uh, outpatient clinics for years where he see patients coming frequently uh, he might know them or she might know them for 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 other pregnancies and in some conditions people come 15 20 times uh, in the outpatient clinic and then come and then say well well, these patients you see here, they could do all the monitoring at home. Well, then you should do something else, like seeing patients who are more ill. Well, that 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 can really, I mean, uh, that's a challenge which 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 really affects people a lot. So so changing what they, the way they work, can be can be quite uh, a challenge. Uh, on the other hand, so some so some some say, "Well, this is this is really good news. I, I like inventing new things, which which certainly helps." And the case with with the midwives, who are definitely not the most uh, technology loving uh, staff uh, we have, it was so amazing that, that because of 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 the response they got from the pregnant women, they said, even though that we don't like technology as per se, this really helps them. Uh, but a lot of colleagues ac across uh, um, whole Denmark is is now supporting the, the idea. The the second question is is was about the 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 uh, the e the e pregnancy for 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 women without complications. Well, that that one was 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 very different because I think basically women without complications shouldn't be seen by the uh, healthcare system uh, or so so i think it, it, it was it, it was it was it was very different and 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 definitely if you look at the business case uh, it wasn't there so i mean you you can definitely introduce things also without having a good business case if it's a good idea um, but i think we're just not yet there What was it? <laughs> yeah, just to follow up on that, I don't know if that was part of your question, but we've just had such a wonderful conference and this question has come up quite a lot over the last couple of days and yesterday there was a great talk by um, Gemma, I forgot her last name, she's at Oxford, um, who was talking about uh, the slippery relation between the um, motivations for implementing e-health between um, actuarial motivations so the risk of overspending and the um, the risk of health risks and maybe health risks in relation to convenience um, that, that you are speaking about. And so while, you know, the initiative you describe is, is, is wonderful, um, but I think it's really important for us as researchers and as well as as clinicians to be aware of when one slips into the other and what kind of justification um, uh, measures are being used and who um, instigates these transformations and who, who does not. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to, to generalize about it, but I think that was really helpful when, when she looked at um, 
the particular mechanisms in place to avoid overspending and the role of uh, e-health in it. And also earlier today, um, Vedita Marie spoke about um, particularly the Denmark case and the social welfare state in the relation to e-health technologies. And I think just having this conference and having your perspective as well as their perspective enriches our, our view on the questions that you're posing. Other questions? Well, I have then for you then, because we're be, be, be beside the home monitoring, I also do do field medicine and and, and a lot of. Uh, uh, so, so my my other part of life is, is prenatal testing and 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 the legacy prenatal testing, prenatal, testing, prenatal di diagnostics, yeah. and and within this field we 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 talk about when do the life begin and and when do the women get you know, get attached. Uh, to, 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 to the growing baby. Of course, the, the two blue marks on the pregnancy test it does a lot, but, but, but how much do you think that, 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 that this new technique, uh, if, if it's, I mean, it's amazing, it's available on, on, the, uh, on the smartphone at home, will, will, will affect uh, the idea of when does life begin, especially regarding the legislation, also possibly of termination pregnancy? Yeah, and that's that's an important risk to keep in mind because then it's a in really interesting combination of the visual cultures of reproduction and a lot has been written primarily in the 90s about the, um, the politics of ultrasound and their role in um, the politics of abortion. And so um, when we look at images of embryos and their relation to um, re regulations. Part of it is terminations, but another part that's particularly relevant at the moment is the 14-day rule for embryo research. So in the UK, um, there's you can only do research for 14 days, and in last year in in Cambridge, the, for the first time, the embryos were cultured up to 13 yet up to 13 days. So potentially taking it beyond the legal limit. Um, so there's a discussion at the moment in the UK of um, how do we conceptualize embryos and how does that relate to ethical boundaries. Um, and I wonder, with this technology, there is very much a framing of the embryos by the clinics as um, you know the start of your baby's life, as well as um, the embryos as a potential of risk. So there is that tension between that. Um, I currently put in for some funding to speak to the people who use this technology to see what their experience is. I haven't um, done that research yet from the experiential point of view. But I think one of the things that's interesting about this is not just how the patients experience it, but how these images get circulated in the broader discourses of the newspapers, of the online social media, uh, and how they're being used quite differently um, by different institutes. So. Um, that's my, my <laughs> characteristically <laughs> vague answer is to your question, but um, um, yeah, that I think that reflects more. Yeah. Just picking up on that last thing you mentioned, the online discussion forums, I know that um, uh, pregnant women or women trying to conceive are very, very active on online discussion forums and have been for, for quite some time. And this is a question also to Kylie, a, as well as anyone else. Um, so uh, have you looked at how women discuss the technology you're talking about on online forums and have any any others of you here done that as well? Because that would be, you know, obviously offer in interesting insights from at least one particular perspective of user groups, the ones who discuss trying to conceive or egg freezing or this kind of embryo technology. Yeah, I mean, I started my research on this in uh, way back in 2011 and there was no real sense of, very few people even knew what egg freezing was and there was a barely even a presence of egg freezing on those fertility sites that you refer to. And in, in some cases, it was almost like these women weren't welcome on these sites because they uh, were electing to choose not to uh, have children yet and weren't experiencing the pains of infertility. Um, but I did do a media analysis of the ways in which egg freezing was presented and, it, and the users of this technology was presented and it was very much as I've kind of already hinted at this idea that the the use of these technologies or the potential users of egg freezing um, which was the, what the focus analysis was were uh, you know electing to to put off motherhood um, and were making active choices to avoid motherhood 
and and these the, these news articles weren't really mentioning or almost obscuring the social relational factors that we know t uh, affect the timing of parenthood where they weren't talking about things such as women's fears of maternity discrimination um, difficulties finding a partner who would commit to parenting uh, d uh, this desire to parent with a particular type of partner this was all the things that were actually going on um, and affecting women's choices around egg freezing but work but this wasn't picked up in the media at all at this time now I finished that media analysis in like 2012 so it's horrifically out of date now so perhaps if I have some time and energies and monies I'd go back and do some more analysis of that or looking at the fertility sites and um, but as I said but when I started it the women who were thinking about freezing eggs weren't really welcome in these spaces and I don't know how that's changed but there are more uh, fertility sites dedicated to um, egg freezing now than there were before but these are generally in an American context rather than in a UK context which is what my research was focusing on I don't know if you've got anything to add to that Lucy yeah. Um, well, in terms of the um, time lapse embryo imaging, I think with the case of progeny, um, one of the main fertility forums is part of the uh, same company that um, manufactures and distributes the machines. So uh, there are discussions about uh, time lapse embryo imaging on there that are either started by um, moderators or that are started by the women themselves. And I've also looked at other forms in which um, people do mention the choice, should I do this or not? Is it worth the extra uh, 750 pounds or not? Have other people done it? Um, it's still relatively new. And I think um, particularly with the live streaming of the embryos and the use of particular fertility apps um, to look at the embryos, that has been uh, introduced in April this year, so it's very recent. Um, but those apps specifically have share buttons and have um, a, a built-in uh, option to share it with friends and family and, and online. So we'll have to wait and see whether that um, will get more of an online uh, presence. Free advertising, isn't it, really? For the, the people, if they're sharing online, the clinics get their name on Twitter or on Instagram. Spread yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there are some logos around the embryo. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah, just uh, sort of a comment from something like I guess twenty between twenty and twenty-five years back. I guess that's one of the few debates on television I remember, um, and that was with another kind of, of fertility techniques, where this was when there was a lot of talk about very very old women getting help by doctors to to give birth to children. Uh, and there was this debate uh, where there was a woman in favor of this technique and a, a male who was against it, and he thought this was sort of a walk in the park. But it turned out that he had no argument whatsoever uh, that that worked in this debate. Uh, it was irresponsible of these very old women to get children. Oh, yeah, but, but they're not older than a lot of men who get children. No, no, that's, that's true. This is very unnatural. Well, a lot of what we do at hospitals is sort of to counteract what's natural. And, and there was nothing left. Uh, and that's probably why I remember this debate. Uh, comments? <laughs> well, um, I, I also wrote a PhD about egg freezing and, and reproductive aging, and um, it's, it's one of the main things that comes up. So there's, there's a tension between um, that notion of, of older motherhood as something that must be regulated at a particular age. And when you look at Western Europe, there's different um, minimum ages for egg freezing, maximum ages for egg freezing in different countries, all with their... Um, own sets of arguments around it, which may make more or less sense. So I'm from the Netherlands, and for example, they've changed the maximum age from 45 to 50 last year. Um, but initially, when they introduced egg freezing, you could only freeze eggs, but not take it up to 50. Um, so there is, on the one hand, a lot of regulation surrounding um, when you can do certain reproductive acts and when not. And oftentimes, that is not a rational um, um, decision, but it is something that's uh, culturally agreed. But on the other hand, we also see um, the on, on the opposite side of very much the commercialization of egg freezing, particularly in the States, as Kylie mentioned, in which um, the opposite is happening, in which all the motherhood is celebrated through celebrities, in which egg freezing is seen as a way of um, being in control, of being empowered. Um, so, um, yeah, I think I think both of those have problematic problematic dimensions to it, and um, 
yeah, it's very interesting to see what comes up in people's discussions. But certainly it's not limited to health concerns or welfare concerns. But there is a particular age normativity that becomes expressed when the um, pre-existing reproductive logic is changed through technological interventions. So um, that's why I think egg freezing is particularly interesting because it makes those um, pre-existing norms very explicit. What about uh, egg freezing paid by your employee, employer? Uh, I know that some of the, the tech companies in Silicon Valley are now offering uh, freeze, uh, egg freezing to, 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 to their staff. Uh, what about that? Yeah, well, actually, I, I didn't talk about it at this time, but that is also progeny. So in, in terms of what I'm writing about in egg freezing is how it is very much embedded in... Um, the implementation of a treatment logic of a particular trajectory of um, managing fertility. So indeed starting with the tests, then with egg freezing, but egg freezing becomes, as it were, an entrance point into a set of other technologies that include time-lapse imaging, genetic testing, uh, single embryo transfer, um, and particular ways of financing that kind of treatment. Um, Progeny is likely to be the company that was behind the introduction of the in, um, insurance for Apple and Facebook that got a lot of um, media hype about it. And um, the thing is, if your employer is doing the smart cycle, which I've briefly referred to, so if you get egg freezing through progeny, you get a particular kind of egg freezing that is um, uh, offered through particular clinics and uh, uh, predetermines a certain uh, set of selection choices. Um, and that is one dimension, that is the, the private sector, you also have the Pentagon offering egg freezing to um, female soldiers, or at least that was being discussed at some point. Um, and you have uh, various um, fertility lenders quite actively promoting egg freezing as a way of um, uh, promoting the financing. So yeah, there there's um, different dimensions to whether it's insurance or lending, uh, debt financing of, of this technology. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, there, there was a lot of there was a lot of fuss of it, and there's been uh, kind of ongoing questions being asked about it in a UK context, and suggestions that UK businesses such as um, law firms are offering it to their female staff, and it's often couched in the suggestion that we're providing women more options, uh, we're you know demonstrating that we care about our female employees, but from kind of a sceptical sociological position or position of a sociologist, I would be say, well, it would be more kind of uh, meaningful, especially in American context, to provide you know secure employment, maternity leave. Um, better kind of options for women to do flexible working, um, provide a more female friendly environment or family friendly family environment than providing women essentially a technology which isn't very good providing it to women at a time when they're probably in, say, their late 30s or beyond, where the success rate of this technology is going to be very poor, and potentially really setting up their female employees to fail um, to the benefit of the employer who has been able to reap the benefits of this person's labour, uh, intellectual, physical or otherwise, in the interim. So, um, I mean, I, I've had, I've swung from one side or the other about egg freezing where I think it's this wonderful uh, technology for women to enable reproductive autom autonomy to actually whether it's something which is a, a red herring, uh, something that isn't really going to be what it's kind of chalked up to be, especially in an American context. I do, I've done a few like uh, small radio programs uh, in America uh, from my office in Leicester about m at midnight. Um, and there's often this very much celebratory uh, kind of tone around egg freezing as being wonderful and I have to chip in every now and again and say, no, I'm more of a critical sociologist on mm -hmm. this. I'm, I'm not going to kind of go in with this bandwagon of it being wonderful and an emancipatory because sadly it's just not, it's not the secret bullet um, that it's been touted to be. Uh, the secret bullet is going to be uh, much, much more uh, time-consuming and therefore l much less interest than people probably uh, uh, ha would have in it than compared to something like egg freezing. Yes, and it's, which doesn't mean that it's, I mean, I also go between both ends because it doesn't mean that it doesn't have merits and it's definitely, it, it may be um, a good choice for some people, but I think this is where we come back to the question uh, that you asked before, where we think about um, 
just to just to point for to one example, I come from the Netherlands. Egg freezing was at first not allowed for two years, and there was a lot of media hype about should it be banned or should it not be banned. And a lot of the discussions around all the motherhood were uh, brought to the fore there. Um, a lot of people said it should be within normal women should reproduce within normal reproductive ages, so therefore we shouldn't allow egg freezing. And then we see in the states much more commercialization, much less of that um, regulation of of uh, uh, the timing of reproduction. Um, now that a couple of years have passed, egg freezing is very unpopular in the Netherlands. There's only a couple of hundred women at most who do it every year, whereas it's booming in the UK and in the US. So we have to think also about, and uh, not just is it beneficial for women or not, but what are the conditions for reproductive decision making and how is the demand around it being created and who plays a role in that and who um, has a stake in having that demand and uh, that is not only the clinics that are n not only the the companies that benefit from it that's also um uh, social media and and um traditional media but it it's really interesting to see that we move away from thinking that this is inherently something that women want but that that production of desire is something that happens in a particular sociality that um we also have to take into account when we discuss these issues Well, thank you so much. I think we have to finish. Yeah, so thank you very much for all of you and for all of you attending. <laughs>